Welcome to the Bothell City Council meeting of October 3rd, 2017. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, all council members are here except council member Spivey who's absent and excused and council member Sandberg who's also absent and excused. We expect her shortly. Uh, meeting agenda, oh actually just first I just wanted to take a moment and say I was just extremely upset about what happened in Las Vegas and I know the rest of the community is as well. So um, please keep all those fam 59 families in your heart. I don't know if it's 59 still but a uh, bunch more wounded. So um, please keep them in your heart and hope that they survive this um, the best way they can. Uh, meeting agenda approval. Is there any changes to tonight's meeting agenda? Seeing none. Uh, review of projected agenda. Is there any changes to the projected agenda? Council member, uh, I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor. Um, I was wondering if we could have a discussion about Country Village if um, the rest of council is interested. Not tonight, but in a future. <coughs> Meeting. Put on the projected agendas. Everybody has uh, everybody. What did we decide? We we're going to vote on individual items. On the projected agendas, is there anybody opposed to adding that to the projected agenda? And we'll add it to a meeting. No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Any other changes to the projected agenda? Seeing none. Uh, review of public engagement opportunities. So we have uh, co Coffee with the Cop, Wednesday, October 4th from 8.30 to 10 a.m. at the Cottage Restaurant. Uh, it's across the street from City Hall. Oktoberfest, uh, Saturday, October 7th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at City Hall Plaza. Council Conversations, Sunday, October 8th, 6 p.m. starting at 6 p.m. at Cloverleaf Rebecca's. Uh, it's also across from City Hall. Bothell Beer Festival, Underground Beer Festival, Saturday, October 14th, noon to 6 p.m. It's underneath the uh, City Hall. Everything's right around City Hall on this list. Uh, community Conversations, Local Perspectives on Opioid Addiction and Recovery, Thursday, October 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. here in the uh, Council Chambers. Wow, there's a lot. Council Candidate Forum hosted by the Greater Bothell Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, Monday, October 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. here in the Council Chambers. And the last one is North Creek Forest Master Plan Public Meeting, Monday, October 30th from 6 to 9 p.m., also here at uh, City Hall. Okay, next is the, uh, we have two different proclamations, so I'll go down to the podium. So uh, Katie Ruff, are you here? Awesome, why don't you come on up? Oh, okay. Unless you don't want to, it's okay. Okay. So this is a proclamation declaring October 2017 as North Shore Schools Foundation All In For Kids Month. Whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation exists to raise funds and build partnerships to fill the gaps in, the su in support of North Shore School District priorities for education, success, and excellence for all North Shore students, teachers, and staff. Whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation exists to enrich the, and enhance individualized learning for each child in the North Shore School District and increase community involvement in student success and to provide funding for shortfalls in student programs for the following categories. Relevant and impactful curriculum, engaged learners, lifelong success, and thriving teachers. Whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation represents the public arm of uh, support for public education in the North Shore area operating separately from the North Shore School District, whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation plays a key role in the North Shore School District's recognition as one of the top school districts in Washington State and across the nation. And whereas the uh, North Shore Schools Foundation has granted over $1.5 million in schools in the North Shore School District and aspires to provide funding and resources that benefit each student and every teacher in all schools every day. Whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation is funded solely through private contributions made annually through the All In For Kids fall campaign and spring community event, the Milk Money campaign, Backpacks For Kids, workplace uh, giving, corporate giving and matching funds, 
legacy giving, Amazon shopping, and other events from supporters, which include students, parents, teachers, staff, residents, local businesses, regional industry, and community-wide supporters for our schools and students. It's pretty extensive. Uh, whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation has mobilized a significant involvement in of over 1,300 people in support the mission of the foundation, whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation has been voted the best of North Shore nonprofit category in 2016 and 17 and has earned the golden participation level through GuideStar. I do hereby proclaim, proclaim the month of October to be the North Shore Schools Foundation All-In for Kids Month in the city of Bothell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, 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 you get this. I get that. Um, thank you so much. So I'm the president this year, and I really just want to invite all of you to our April 24th luncheon. It will be at Evergreen Church. We usually have about 500 people there, um, parents, businesses. Um, it's a really great community event, and I promise you'll be inspired for what we do for the kids. Um, also, we have other events like the Wine Walk, November 11th. So even if you can come out and support those events, it does a lot for raising um, money for the kids and the students and the teachers. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, next is, what is that? Rachel Kruin Krinsky? Oh, Krinsky, thank you. And then there's another sticky here. What's this say? Okay, got it. Never mind. Okay, here we go. So this is a proclamation of the city of Bothell, uh, dedicating, and it's also October, as Domestic Violence Action Month. Whereas domestic violence is a serious crime that affects one in four women and one in seven men during their lifetime. And whereas domestic violence is widespread and has a devastating impact on survivors, children, families, and our community. And whereas domestic violence does not discriminate and crosses all economic, racial, gender, educational, religious, and societal barriers and is sustained by indifference. And whereas the ending the cycle of this vicious crime requires the courage of survivors and the support of the larger community. And whereas education, prevention, and intervention efforts to end the cycle of domestic violence are imperative to not only protect survivors, but also to increase public awareness of the severity and extent of domestic violence. Now, therefore, I, Andrew John Rayum, the mayor of the city of Bothell, do hereby proclaim October uh, as the Domestic Violence Action Awareness Month. Well, I, had, I added awareness, sorry. Domestic Violence Action Month. And you we'll want to take awareness. Too. Okay, awareness. <laughs> I just came in, up here as the executive director of LifeWire, which is based right here on the east side, um, because I wanted to thank the city of Bothell and Mayor Rayum for recognizing Domestic Violence Action Month. Um, and for partnering with LifeWire, our partnerships with the East Side cities are a critical part of our ability to respond to survivors and to provide prevention services. Um, those statistics of one in four people, one in four women and one in seven men mean that all of us are likely touched, whether we know it or not, by domestic violence. Um, so we just really want to thank you for your partnership, and if anyone would like to learn more about domestic violence or how you can be involved in Do Domestic Violence Action Month, which is going on all around the country, you can just visit our website at lifewire.org. Thank you very much. All right, next on the agenda is a staff brief briefing, briefing sorry, by the city clerk on the public records management program. She's got to do two jobs at one time, so. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Laura Hathaway. I'm the city clerk, but I'm also the official records manager for the city of Bothell. And so tonight I wanted to just give you a brief update on some public records laws that have been uh, were, became effective uh, July 23rd of this year, and just kind of have a brief update on what those laws mean for the city. So House Bill 1594 went into effect on July 23rd this year. Highlights of, of this bill, it requires training for records officers every four years 
to address issues of retention, production, and disclosure of electronic records. That includes updating and improving technology information services. It establishes a program with the Office of the Attorney General and State Archives to consult with local governments on public record best practices, creates a grant program within the Office of Secretary of State for local governments to improve their public records management systems. It is important to note that while these programs are being developed, they will sunset in 2020. So I don't have a lot of detail about these grant programs yet because we haven't received any. Um, I'm a thinking we'll probably get something towards the end of the year and we'll, we'll get, bring back more information then. In addition, we must now report annually to the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee, which is also known as JLARC. JLARC requires 17 reporting criteria annually. Um, I didn't list them all here, but some of them are the number of records we provide within five days, the number of records that go beyond five business days, number of requests denied, number of requests where the agency asked for clarification, number of requests, requests abandoned, portion of requests fulfilled electronically compared to those fulfilled physically, estimated staff time spent on each request, and agency costs for managing and retaining records. House Bill 1595 also went into effect July 23rd this year. Highlights of that, it allows the city to charge a small fee for providing electronic records. We could not do that before. We could only charge for physical paper records. The city is working on a fee schedule consistent with state law and will come back to council in November with the rest of the fee schedule. It prohibits overly broad requests. It creates the ability for cities to deny overwhelming computer-generated bot requests, and requests must be for an identifiable record. No longer can somebody request, make a request for all the city's records. They can't do that. It has to, they have to identify what they're looking for. So that's, that's a big one. Um, so earlier this year, the city contracted with GovQA, and this was before these new laws came out. Um, and we, to get a new public records management portal. We went live with that portal August 28th, and in large part that was due to our new public records specialist position that we hired in, in the city clerk's office. She's worked tirelessly along with the public records position in the police department to really vet that and get all our questions answered and get it up and running. And, and it was up and running within a month and a half after we um, signed the contract. The system allows us not only to track requests, it, uh, but it allows us to communicate and invoice requesters and allows the requesters to make online payments and download their documents. It provides a redaction tool, which also serves as our ex exemption log. And it allows us to generate the reports necessary to the JLARC and also come back to council with reports. And um, along with that, it's my last slide, this is what the portal looks like on the website. There is a frequently asked questions regarding public records there. It's a little small to read, but, um, and also there's a deflection tool. So if we, if somebody asks for something and it's already somewhere on the website, it's going to deflect to, to where that is. Say they have a budget question or a um, Bothell Municipal Code question, or we also have a document library now. Um, it's mostly got city clerk um, information on it, like ordinances, minutes, resolutions, contracts, but we're hoping to expand that to other departments and it will deflect if it, you know, if a person puts a keyword in. And then it also allows the user to track the status of their request. So that's just a brief um, outline of what's happening in the lovely public records world, so, <laughs> which, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, that's a super nice uh, software and access to our, our it's, records. It's, it, we haven't had a single hiccup with it yet, and um, and people are using it. And we had maybe one or two people that called and they were a little confused by it early on, and now it's just running like, I mean, people just go there. So it's... Does it track how many record requests or how, how many are we at since August? I, I haven't looked so far. Um, since August 28th, I haven't looked, but I, I can. Yeah, we'll track how many we get how many we answer within the five days. It'll track a, a multitude of reports. We can configure it however we want. Very cool. And yeah, I'd be happy to come back later in the year or once we've, you know, so. Or an email, whatever. Is there uh, any questions from the council? All right. They're mesmerized. They're fascinated.
Thank you. <laughs> that wasn't it, I know. <laughs> so, wow, wow, we're moving right along. Hold on. So we're on to the um, public uh, visitor comment period. So this is um, each person, I read the part out of the protocol manual. Uh, each person addressing the council will give her, his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record and unless the council grants further time shall limit the address to three minutes. No person other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion either directly or through a member of the council without the permission of the mayor. And I have three, sorry I'm buried in paperwork today, there we go. The first one is uh, David Bain. Hi, I'm David Bain and I'm here to suggest a fourth option for the council to consider regarding near-term maintenance of the Wayne Golf Course. Council could direct staff to arrange for the community to do most of the work. For example, Friends of North Creek Forest has been providing about three FTEs and volunteer and staff time for stewardship, saving the city about $500,000 over the past few years. Volunteers and local businesses could help in several ways. E.g., some uses of the land could be authorized, such as disc and foot golf and an off-leash dog park, and user groups could be assigned responsibility for maintenance. Areas where restoration is likely to consist of revegetation could be planted by volunteers. These activities would reduce the areas that need to be mowed. Further, parts of the activity zones could be left unmown as weeds taking root there would be removed when those parts of the property are developed. Having volunteers doing the mowing offers two advantages. One, there would be a significant reduction in the staff time involved. Second, mowing would not need to be done during regular business hours, meaning it may be possible to avoid purchase of a new mower. While volunteer capacity within the city may already be spread thin with North Creek Forest and Shelton View Forest work parties, the land has regional significance and we can expect help in maintaining the new park. Bothell based Whale Scout recently received funding to recruit some of the state's half million whale watchers to participate in salmon recovery events. The Mid Sound Fisheries Enhancement Group is working on restoring the Sammamish River and is interested in helping here. The Friends of the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery see restoration at Wayne as a way to improve survival of their fish. One Bothell has thousands of supporters, including many in surrounding communities, who could be asked to help. We also we can also recruit support from other government agencies such as the King Conservation District and the Washington Conservation Corps. The clubhouse could be converted into an office center for several uh, conservation groups active in Bothell. Co-locating these groups could create a synergy that would significantly benefit the city. It would alleviate concerns about maintaining the clubhouse as these groups could take care of that as a condition of occupancy. A local business may want to use it to continue food and beverage services or uh, provide recreation services. Volunteer work can be used to generate metrics of community support. Media coverage and photographs showing the work in progress could also be included in applications for grants to bring in millions of dollars in external funding. Submissions of major grants would begin in the spring, so getting work started soon would be important. Small grants might be submitted even sooner. The steering committee put in place to work on the acquisition of and visioning for the property uh, could supervise these projects. Since much of the course is flood control structure, the Army Corps of Engineers would be an important addition to the leadership group. In conclusion, the city could explore covering most or all of these extra responsibilities with existing staff and equipment by turning to regional volunteers for help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it says the curmudgeon, but Al, I, I don't think that's your real name. Go ahead, Al Fagenbaum. Good evening, everybody. I haven't seen you guys for a while. It's time for me to give you some hell. I'm not happy about what's going on with Country Village. You guys are all aware of it. And it's a shame if what they're planning actually occurs. Now, I can understand the Loveless family. They're getting old. It's, it's a lot of work, and they want to get a return on their investment. I don't blame them at all. But my question is, and I wonder, has the city council ever even talked with them when they first heard they were looking to sell the property? To try and see if there's some way the city 
could get involved and keep it the way it is. It's, it's an iconic place. It's like the Pike Place Market is to Seattle. This is Bothell's Pike Place Market. And to me, it would be an absolute shame to see it turned into condominiums. Does Bothell really need more condominiums on 527? I don't think so. And I would like to see you guys, if you haven't already done so, investigate to see what could be done to preserve Country Village the way it is. Maybe nothing, I don't know, but I think at least somebody should make a real strong effort to see if there's money available somewhere. Uh, I, 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 as just a, as a layman, as a citizen with no expertise, I'm only asking that something there be done to try and save Country Village. I know there are petitions going around. Uh, people are not too happy, but I just found out about it uh, last Sunday that it was up for sale. It has not been sold yet. There's a feasibility study going on. It's, it's going to take a while. So maybe there's an opportunity. I don't know. But uh, if you guys haven't done so, shame on you. That's all I can say, because this is going to be your legacy, as far as I'm concerned. If Country Village becomes condominiums, it's, it's this city council did not make an effort to prevent that from happening. That's all I want to see is an effort to do something. I don't know what, if anything can be done, maybe nothing, but at least the city council, if they haven't done so, should try. Thank you. Thank you. We did put it on the projected agenda, and we'll, so we'll talk with the city manager. Uh, next is Philip Moser. Hi, um, I'm also going to be speaking out of ignorance, as some people have said, but ask my wife and friends. I do it frequently. Um, my wife and I moved here about two and a half years ago, and right after we went under contract, as we're driving around, we said, you know, maybe we should pay attention to these signs that say, save Wayne. We should figure out who Wayne is. Um, <laughs> since then, found out a little more. and. Um, I started golfing, I get, you guys getting that picture? I started golfing a little more than half a century ago, and then I took a 50-year hiatus uh, before I moved here, and I go like, well, if there's a golf course across the street from me, maybe I should try this again. And for my level of golf, that's a great golf course. I got no complaints. Um, it owes me a lot more balls than I owe it. Um, but over the course of using that in a couple of years, I've made a lot of new friends. I've brought a lot of old friends up to Bothell to play with, and I've just enjoyed the heck out of it. Um, never more than nine holes at a time, and always tired after seven. Um, the golf course, I realize, is not probably long-term for this city, but anything we can do to extend its use, as long as we can do it, I'd love to be a part of making that happen. I'd love to you guys be a part of making that happen. Um, I think it provides a sense of community. It provides a source of exercise. It can, people can hold events there. It serves the schools. It serves the community. Um, it's got, you run into deers, trees, shrubs. I've had bows and arrows show up in uh, trees right by tees over in the back nine. Um, there's nothing you don't run in there. It's a great stress reducer. Um, and uh, Again, I'm not currently addressing, because I don't have the expertise or background right now to do it, I know there's economic issues here. I know there's contractual. I know there's where are we going to get what grants, what do those grants allow or don't allow. But um, if there's any way we can make anything happen, still last thread, I'd love to be part of any one last chance that there can be. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have no other sign-up sheets. It's, does anybody else go ahead and come up to the podium and give your name for the record? Um, thank you. My name is Whitney Negebauer, and I am a resident of Bothell. I'm also the director of a group called Whale Scout. Um, our mission is to protect Pacific Northwest whales through land-based conservation experiences. Um, I'm here today to urge, on behalf of myself and our organization, the city to be immediately begin the restoration of the Wayne property. The, the Sammamish River and the surrounding property is very important to Chinook salmon, which are important to 
endangered southern resident killer whales, which that's their primary prey. Uh, there are only 76 southern resident killer whales left. That's a 30-year low. So there's really no time to wait, and we urge the city to begin restoration as soon as possible. In fact, now is uh, the ideal planting season. Um, Whale Scout has uh, at least 65 volunteers. We've volunteered at locations such as North Creek Forest uh, in the past. Over the last four years, we've planted hundreds of trees, giving thousands of hours of our service. Uh, we pledge our service uh, moving forward to the restoration of the Wayne property. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to provide public comment? Go once, twice, okay. We're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Uh, there's nothing been pulled. Is there a motion to approve it? So moved. It's moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilmember McNeil to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. Passes unanimously with Councilmember Spivey absent and excused. We're on to AB 17-158, approval of four art sculptures for the Bothell City Hall. And I believe we have Danae McGee here to provide a staff presentation. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Danae McGee, and I am the Tourism and Events Coordinator here at the City of Bothell, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the um, Arts and Festivals Commission. Um, they are interested in purchasing four bronze sculptures by well-known artist um, Georgia Gerber. Uh, the four pieces are uh, City Hall Cat, a beaver that is standing, a beaver with a kit, and an otter. The first piece is in memoriam by the Bothell community and staff to the cat that lived outside the old city hall. The piece will sit and greet people as they step onto the last stair on the northeast side of city hall off of 185th. This piece is more expensive than the other pieces proposed since it will be a one of a kind work and not available for resale by the artist. The other three works will be located in front of City Hall at the, three at the uh, fountains. The first two, Beaver and Beaver with Kit, will sit at the center fountain. The Beaver is $3,600 and the Beaver with Kit is $4,400. The final piece will sit in the left when facing the fountain. This is the otter and is also $3,800. All of these pieces are designed to be interactive, which is how the um, locations were selected by, um, by the artist as well as um, members of the commission and, um, and uh, staff at City Hall. The total cost for all four pieces is $19,580, and the funds will come from the city's 1% for public art funds. The current balance of that fund is $137,553. If all four pieces are approved tonight, the new, the new balance will be $117,973. We do have a member here tonight from the Arts and Festivals Commission, and um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Could you explain for the public the 1% for the arts budget and how that works? 
Uh, sure. Um, it's a um, capital fund that is used by uh, city hall or city properties, um, and it's all above ground properties. And the funding is 1% of a capital fund project uh, put on by the city. It does not relate to privately funded projects. Um, it is above ground, so nothing below ground is included in that. Grants are also not included in that total. And that's a state requirement of local government projects above ground to have a arts fund? Um, not necessarily. Uh, cities adopt them according to their needs and wishes. Oh, okay. Did you have something to add there? I just wanted, just one second. Oh. Just wanted to clarify that it is city code, the percent for arts program. Okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions? Deputy Mayor? I just had a quick question about the staff report. Um, I didn't understand, um, it talks about in reviewing historic documents, the developer's original budget for City Hall Art was 314,884. Um, and then it says, due to changes in staff, the Arts Commission was never able to implement phase two of their art and the remaining 157, 445, could not be rolled into the city's 1% for public arts funds, since these funds were private funds and not public funds. I'm just a little confused about what that means. Um, originally, the the project for City Hall um, was created using the bond for the, for the building of, of City Hall. Um, those funds only came from that, from that bond and they were not available once the completion of City Hall occurred. So any funds that were left over um, were, no, were not available to roll over into the city's 1% for public art funds. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, so we can take each piece of artwork at a time. I just want to see nod of heads if we want to take one at a time. Are we okay with the slate? Slate. Looks like slate's okay. All right, is there a motion to approve all pieces of artwork on this? Move the recommended action. Second. Moved by Councilman Agnew, seconded by Councilman McNeil to approve the, uh, approve the recommended action to approve the, what are they called? There we go. The City Hall Cat, Beaver Standing, Beaver with Kit, and the Otter. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, go ahead and place your vote. Passes unanimously with Council Member Spivey absent and excused. We are on to new business, AB 17-159, the 2018 Utility Rate Review, and we have Mr. Fien to give us a presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Don Fien, Utility Services Manager. And this is a utility rate review for the uh, water, sewer, and stormwater rate increases. Uh, background, um, city staff has been working with FCS group on several utility rate issues. Um, the analysis involved has involved uh, data gathering and meetings with uh, engineering staff, operations staff, finance staff, and that analysis has included utility rates the six-year financial plan and capital facility charge recommendations. Um, previously completed tasks were the long-range rate analysis and projections for each utility, capital facility charge calculations for each utility. And this year, a cost of service analysis was completed for the water and sewer utilities. And with that, I have a presentation from John Gilarducci of FCS Group, and then he'll hand it back to me after that. And I'll put this slide on here. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, 
and here's John. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Mayor and Council. The way that we've set this up, um, we'll g I'll go through a little bit of background, a little bit of background um, on the utilities, and then talk about background for the project itself, and then we'll get right into results. So we'll we'll uh, move along rather swiftly. The city has looked at cost of service before. In 2011, there was a water cost of service analysis done, but the, the implementation of those results was delayed because of the impact it would have on single family residences. We have, as Don mentioned, um, in 2016 presented revenue requirement results, and that's what um, the result of a revenue requirement analysis are recommended percentage adjustments to the rates. And so that's where the 3% for water and 2% increase for sewer uh, came from, was as a result of that 2016 study. And tonight we're here with cost of service results. This is what the study looks like graphically. You see uh, that in the, in the middle column there, the second block down revenue requirement, that's the first major landmark in a rate study. And the revenue requirement is simply the determination of how much money is needed from rates in order to meet all the financial obligations of each utility. So we do that separately for the water and the sewer utilities. We look at planned capital projects, the operating budget. We try to forecast inflation to arrive at percentage increases or adjustments. In this case, they were increases for each utility. The next major step is that cost of service analysis. And this is where we look not at the amount of revenue needed in total, but the equity of the rates. And that is which customer classes should be paying what in order to generate the needed revenue. This is about the fairness of the rates. In order to arrive at that conclusion, for water, you see the, the five blue boxes there. We take the costs that make up the revenue requirement and we allocate them to these different functions, customer service, fire protection, providing peak demand water and providing average demand water. Once we have those buckets, if you will, uh, of costs, then we look at how different customer types demand each of those different functions and that's how you end up with rates that vary by customer type. We do the same thing for wastewater or sewer. Our, we have fewer categories because treatment is provided um, outside of the city. You've got customer flow and treatment. But again, then we look at how different customer types demand those functions and that's how we arrive at, at rates that vary by customer type, which the city has now. So what we'll be looking at are recommendations about how the rate structures should be tweaked in order to be consistent with the cost of service findings and more equitable and still generate the amount of revenue that's needed. So moving right into the water results, these were the increases that were presented to the council in late 2016 and adopted for 2017, the 3%, there's a 3% uh, increase also recommended for 2018. Moving into the cost of service analysis, this is what that allocation to functions looks like for the water utility. You see the two largest components are costs associated with meeting peak demand water and then also providing water for average day demand. You'll notice slices there for fire protection, customer service, and meters and services, which is basically local connections. Once we have these allocations done, we look at, again, how customer types demand those functions, and that's what results in shifts among customer types. So under your current rates, the 2017 adopted rates, the most notable difference is for the single family residential class. They're carrying 31% of the cost recovery burden right now um, in the water rates. What the cost of service analysis shows is that that should be more like 36% and the slices for the other three major categories, irrigation, uh, commercial, and multifamily, should all go down slightly in order to make that correction. 
what that would look like to actually implement, and, and I would direct you to the right-hand column of this table, in order to achieve a 3% rate increase for 2018, each class's rates should be adjusted as shown here in order to make that cost of service correction. Single family rates should go up a little over 19%, multifamily, commercial, and irrigation should all go down, and the weighted average aggregate result would be a 3% increase in revenue. Understanding that this would be a difficult pill to swallow in one year and um, uh, there is not a requirement that you make this adjustment in one year. What we've laid out is a, a way to get there or get close, get within 5% of cost of service by phasing those impacts. So instead of a 19% increase for single family in 2018, uh, the city would adopt two 8% increases and you see very modest lower than the 3% um, aggregate increase for all other customer classes and no increases for irrigation because they were the ones that were supposed to go down the most. So this would achieve the 3% increase for 18 and then again for 19. Uh, shifting over to wastewater or, or sewer, uh, these are the increases that were presented again in late 2016 with the 2% increase being adopted for 2017 and also recommended for 2018. The allocation of costs is, is simpler in sewer. There are fewer, uh, fewer components, treatment flow and customer service with treatment costs um, related to payments to King County for treatment. Interestingly, the shift between multifamily and commercial and single family goes the other way, not as, not, as, not as much as it does for water, but you see single families share of the burden now at 57% should actually be 56% as shown by the cost of service analysis and a slight increase in multifamily and commercial rates to achieve that. In order to achieve the 2% aggregate increase uh, needed for 2018, again, if you look at the right-hand column on that table, to get to that 2% increase, the city could increase single-family residential by less than 1% and multifamily and commercial by 3.7%, so the weighted average would result in a 2% increase, and that would make the full correction, the full cost of service correction in one year, so there's no phasing needed for, uh, for sewer. And that's the point of this slide to show you simply that in 2018, you could make that, the city could make that full shift by increasing single family 0.7%, multifamily and commercial by 3.7. And then in 2019, just across the board, 2% increases to each class would, would get you where you need. Just to give you a sense of how these proposals would impact a typical single family bill, if you look at the impact of recommended 2% and 3% increases, if they were applied across the board, that means the average single family bill would go up about 2.3% in each year. That's the combined effect of the water increase and the sewer increase. If the city were to adopt the proposed water and sewer cost of service results, and you see the phasing there for water in the blue portion of the stack bar, 8% per year, and then the sewer portion, 0.7% per year in 2018, and then the full 2% in 2019. The weighted average of those combined impacts would be 3.2% in the total water sewer combined bill for a typical single family residence in 2018, and 4.2% in 2019 and that would achieve, at least for single family, that would achieve the uh, cost of service recommendations by the end of 2019. This uh, just shows a summary of, of the material we just went through, uh, the proposed percentage increases by customer class for water 
and then sewer you see without the phasing um, in the lower portion of the, of the sewer table. Increases would be effective January 1st by our recommended approach. And with that, I'll, I'll go into each utility and a little background and our recommendations. Um, the utility, uh, bottled water utility, this is the pie and where all the money goes that we generate. Um, the two biggest portions are the capital improvement projects and debt and wholesale water purchase from Seattle. And third is the uh, O&M, operations and maintenance. Is our ebb and flow of our um, revenues and expenditures. And you can see the big factors have been over the years, Public Works Op Center and loan to the storm utility in 2010. Um, you can see the high facility charge revenues <laughs> during the recovery from the recession and also Coinciding with that are downtown water replacement projects and Penn Park res Reservoir expenditures. And you can see the um, expenditures and revenues were keeping very close to each other, which is what you want to do. Um, here's some of the major projects we have in our 2017 and 18 budget. The Penn Park Reservoir replacement, which was completed this year. Um, total approximate cost is $3.7 million, $320,000 last year. Our asset management system also completed this year. Total approximately $120,000, $40,000 was in 2017. We have $682,000 worth of water main replacement slated in the biennium. Um, we have $536,000 in the Morningside Improvements Project and $807,000 in downtown revitalization projects, and we have $831,000 slated for the Bloomberg Reservoir painting. So our recommendations, um, and to go along with what John had spoke to before, 3% average rate increase in the water utility, but an 8% for the single family, and 1.1% for multifamily. The typical monthly rate um, for single family in 2018 would be 42.16 with uh, per month with that rec recommendation. Uh, it'd be an increase of three dollars and twelve cents per month for the average single family residence. Um, we would again recommend three percent in 2019, uh, and for single family that would be eight percent again and. Uh, a 1.1% uh, for multifamily. <clears throat> the rate increase for 2019 will be reevaluated in the middle of next year. And the rate drivers have been an aggressive capital program coinciding with our downtown revitalization, replacing all the infrastructure while we have everything uh, torn up. And um, the Seattle wholesale water increase is 5.5% this year and next year. Um, water conservation has an impact. We have fixed costs and the less, and people are using less water, which is what we want, but we have fixed costs, so it's a, a rate driver that increases the rates. Um, and on the positive side, to keep the rates down, we've had generated $3.1 million in capital facility charges over um, a period between beginning of 2012 to the end of 2016. Very great revenues there. Um, with the recommendation, our rates would still be low or low middle 
uh, compared to our neighbors. And um, I think you would characterize them as low if you're comparing to cities that have to buy from buy Seattle water. The two lowest on there, Linwood and Alderwood, are very difficult to compete with. They buy much, a much cheaper uh, Everett and Alderwood water. Moving on to the sewer utility, um, this is where the money goes. Um, you can see similar to what John had said, the sewage treatments, uh, a little over 50% of the pie in two, the 2017 and 18 budget. That's the biggest portion. Our O&M, operations and maintenance, is only 14%, and uh, capital and debt is 17%. Those are the big, the big ones. Here's the ebb and flow of uh, uh, revenues and expenses. Similar to the water, you can see how things kind of picked up during the recovery, <clears throat> both in revenues and in expenditures as we're building downtown. Um, major projects in the 2017 and 18 budget for li the lift station three improvements, 530,000 to wrap up that project. The whole project cost is 1.1 million. Sewer pipeline replacement, close to two million in two years. Um, the asset management system, once again, for that utility. The promontory hillside sewer, which just was recently completed. And we also have a sanitary sewer comprehensive plan that's in progress. And overall, we recommend a 2% increase for the sewer. That's uh, made up of a 0.7 increase for single family and, and 3.7 increase for multifamily, as John spoke to earlier. And the monthly average single residential sewer rate increase would be 51 cents per month. And we're projecting a 2% increase in 2019. And the rate drivers for the sewer utility, similar to water, are the, um, the replacement aggressive capital program, um, including the uh, lift station we spoke about, um, and three in the last few years, um, and King County uh, treatment increases of 5.2% uh, in 2018, um, keeping the rates down as with the water utility, good facility charge revenues close to $3 million from 2012 through the end of 2016. Sewer utility rate comparisons, we're on, we're on the high side on that one. However, we're close to, pretty fairly close to Woodenville and Kirkland in their rates. And, and the next one down, Bellevue, they tack on a big capital recovery charge for 10 years. So it's essentially higher than it shows. The storm utility. Um, the pie there, um, capital improvement projects and debt, 42%. Staff, O&M, um, 36%. Those are the biggest costs in the storm utility. Similar to the other two ut utilities, you see the big spike up in the recovery years. And we had the big Horse Creek project, of course, which $18 million project. So that was... Um, real challenge to fund. Um, the major stormwater system projects, the Horse Creek project, once again, was wrapped up. Um, total of over $18 million project. It was 120000 in 17. Um, asset management, 120000 Total downtown revitalization projects, citywide storm improvement projects, $1.7 and we have a, a, a project in Sammamish River, Wainita Creek, and an illicit discharge screening plan. And overall, in the storm utility, we're recommending another 2.5% increase in 2018 per our rate study we completed last year, and projecting 2.5% again next year. It's a 34 cent per month increase. In the storm utility, we're low middle in our rates compared to the others in our area. And we look at all the combined utilities, we're right in the middle 
of the pack um, there as well. With that, um, staff invites council comments, recommendations, and we do have a public hearing in two weeks. Thank you, sir. Is there any questions? Deputy Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to clarify because there was um, some history um, that I was reading over. So there are no um, changes to the capital facilities charges this time around, correct? No, the, the, we, so we bring back, with the fee resolution, we bring back the capital facility charges. We would recommend cost of living only for that. Okay, great, thanks. And then um, when you uh, describe um, our capital program as aggressive, um, can you explain what that means? Does it mean an aggressive schedule or, or reasons why? Is it like our infrastructure is aging all at once or? So in particular, the downtown had very aging infrastructure, as, asbestos cement, um, water mains, um, concrete, poorly old concrete uh, sewer mains. Um, we had the Horse Creek project uh, where it was a, a pipe, a, a piped creek um, in a undersized pipe going in the middle of properties. So we had a big, a lot of challenges. We had we needed a, for the capacity needs of the downtown, we did, needed to upgrade the Penn Park Reservoir. Um, we've had lift station, prod, uh, old lift station, station uh, problems. So um, it's more than I would, I would ex you would expect typically, I think, from a city of this size. But part, a bit, large part of the driver was we're tearing up all the downtown. Um, we don't want to have to re-tear it up later. Um, we've got this bad infrastructure. Let's do it now. And that, that, that's been the plan for many years, and, and, we, and we've carried that out. So is it a phase we're in that we anticipate getting out of at some point? Yeah, that I, I, I think we'll be on a less, a less aggressive, I guess it would be the term, a program that'll be, um, we'll try, you'll steadily try to improve infrastructure. If you have 100 miles of water pipe and you expect it to live 100 years, you actually need to replace uh, one mile every year, which, so, you and you have to think that way because mm -hmm. you're leaving this for the next generation and you, you could just not, you know, have a very meek program and then, so later on, somebody's going to get slammed with having to, to deal with it. So you don't want to do that. So, um, I th you know, I think the city, you know, for some time has had this programmed in the in the in the water, sewer, and storm, you know, plans to to do this, and and we followed through with it. Okay, thanks. And then um, the other clarification I was hoping for is we always talk about how Horse Creek was eighteen million dollars, but I. I'm trying to, um, I guess, ask, it, my understanding, and maybe it's wrong, but my understanding was that um, the cost of it went up because while it was opened up, we decided to replace things that we didn't originally intend to replace. Is that accurate? Um, well, what happened, so when I first came here seven, over seven and a half years ago, the, um, the plan was to build a new pipe system, a bigger pipe. And it, it appeared there was no way we were going to get that through the agencies. It would not. It would not. It would not go through. And um, so then, the only way we would get the approval would to be open to open have open channel and crossings under the roadways. Um, so that's that was the biggest driver to make the price go up. We did, however, institute um, capital facility charges, both citywide, which we didn't have, and a special one for the downtown. So the development community is helping pay for that. So the ratepayers are not paying the, uh, paying the whole burden of that. So that, that's part of the bright side. And, and with that, the downtown, um, the downtown owners have a, have a, don't have to provide detention because we have a direct discharge line to the river. They do have to treat the pollution generated uh, water from the site, but they don't have to detain and uh, detain the uh, water beforehand. So. so the $18 million isn't being completely paid or wasn't completely paid it, by the ratepayers. Rate yeah, it's closer to more, it's, it, it, 
uh, over a 20 year period, I'd say it's going to be more like somewhere between 50 to 60 percent the ratepayers, and the rest will be the development community, actually. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Sure. Councilmember Sandberg. So, thank you for your presentation. You get to go early tonight, which is unusual. Um, the one thing that stood out, obviously, is that 19.3% increase in the water rate for single family customers. And I was trying to understand from the data presented by FCS Group how you arrive at that cost allocation. And um, I guess I, I didn't understand from the, 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 the study how that happens. And is that related to those pie charts where you show de uh, an increase in peak demand and yes. so a little explanation on it that is. because it sounded it, what we got was a we put it in a box mm -hmm. and bing out pop 19.3 percent increase for single family payers so i'd like to know a little bit more what's in the box i'll let john handle that but it, you you are correct it is part that pie chart does explain part of it but i'll let uh, john explain further I can actually talk yeah. while you're looking at that. Um, we did simplify the process quite a bit in what we in what we showed you. Um, that pie chart is the result of a of a very detailed analysis in which we go through um, basically every expense in the revenue requirement. So every every operating expense, every capital expenditure, every component of that revenue requirement. And we look at the different functions and determine which functions are causing that expense and assign it across those categories. And we do that line item by line item. So the result of that, we do that by assigning percentages to, to each function. The result of that is the bottom line, you'll have that total revenue requirement number. Let's say it's four and a half million dollars, which is close to what it is for, for water. And you will know then, as a result of all those line item allocations, how much of that four and a half million is attributable to meeting peak demands, how much is attributable to meeting average or base demand, how much is attributed to fire protection. And then we actually look at the detailed customer statistics to see, okay, uh, how much of the peak water are single family residences using as a class compared to commercial and multifamily, and that's how we determine what their share is, which was the final pie chart we showed you. So we can we can tell through that analysis first how the revenue requirement breaks down among the functions, and then who uses those functions or demands them more than others, and that's how we end up at the rates by customer class. I hope that's. So on that pie chart, you showed there was peak demand past and then peak demand new, um, I thought. And so. Okay, so um, it's this one. So this is the, the pie chart on the right is after the analysis. And what that has told us is, is after this allocation to the different functions, we then looked at each of these customer classes in this pie, and we were able to determine from their actual behavior how much of the peaking share of the previous pie single family residences should pay as a result of their peaking behavior. What is peaking behavior? Oh, what is peak demand? Summer, it's summer usage. So, so basically, when um, in the summer when folks are watering lawns and using more water, you see, you know, if you're looking at the the month to month demand for water, it goes way up in the summer and that's peak, that's peak demand, peak season demand. And that is a very costly, um, that's a very costly demand for a water utility to meet because you have to size all the facilities to meet those peak demands, even though they're not necessarily there year round. And I thought I saw somewhere in the study that the irrigation customers are unaffected by any rate changes. Well, the, the irrigation customers, uh, they're not unaffected. It just means that right now they're, they are 
appropriately shouldering their burden according to the cost of service study. In fact, it should tick down slightly, but they're still 19% of the burden of those costs. And that's because I can't tell you exactly, but in all likelihood, they are peaking at a less less steep peaking curve than they have in the past, and that's what's reflected in this rate going forward. Even though their demand for irrigation also goes up in the summer, and so you're building a system not just for single family irrigation use, but for everybody else's irrigation use. Yeah, th so the irrigation customers we're talking about here are irrigation only meters, and you're right, they peak they peak substantially. That's they really only use water in the summer. All this is telling us is compared to what they were doing in 2017 and before, 2016 and before, that peaking has tape tapered or mellowed a little bit. They're still, you know, as a as a number of customers, they're a very small fraction of the number of customers and they're shouldering 19 percent of the cost burden so that they're still paying they're paying their full share if that's any reassurance okay um, and then I thought um, so it also said in the study that for the cost allocation that single family customers actually got a little bit of a break or, in the sewer, on the That's sewer right. side of things. But I thought our sewer bills were tied directly to our water bills. Basically, water in equals water out. So aren't our sewer rates essentially rising from the water side of things? They, they are closely tied, but um, uh, again, this is all about relative to the other classes. So it means that um, and, and because of the way that the costs break down, with so much of these costs going to treatment, and excuse me, I'm looking for the sewer, which single family pays less of a share of the treatment costs because at domestic strength, they don't require as much treatment as, as many commercial customers. Um, what's that? This one. Yeah, yeah. So there, as a result of that two-step process, their burden again ticks down very slightly for sewer. And then, um, so the the revenue that comes into the utilities is a combination of capital facility charges and rates. Is that correct? That's correct. The capital facilities charge revenue can only be used for capital. It, it is not available for operations. Okay. Um, and so are we, are we using all of our, are, are, are we covering all of our capital costs by the capital facilities charges or are we subsidizing some of them by the user rates? They're, they're a combination of both rates and capital facilities charges that funds the capital. So maybe Don is able to answer this. You said for the downtown, you thought at the end of, for, um, at the end of the 20 year period, that the downtown developers would be paying 50 to 60 percent for Horse Creek. Yeah. For Horse Creek, and I thought when we had seen that previously, that actually that curve had been bent um, to the disadvantage of the ratepayers. Actually, the ratepayers were going to be picking up a little bit more, like 64 percent. Right, and we increased uh, we increased yeah. that charge. Uh, I think it was the year before last. So do you know overall for um, the, the water, sort of the non-downtown, not the special district, but overall um, for the city utilities, what percentage um, of the costs are borne by capital facility charges for new growth mm -hmm. versus existing rate payers? Well, the capital facility charges um, fluctuate wildly. And when now, right now, when we have booming a booming economy and so much a building, we get a lot of we're getting a lot of revenue, so it's uh, they're they're helping fund a very large portion of the the capital right now. But like when we were in, I think when I first came here in the middle of the recession, 2010, we almost got nothing in capital facility charges. So it 
you have to be careful with that um, you uh, when you set your rates because you have to be careful when those times hit you can't depend totally on the facility charges but you can tend to, you can depend on them some for sure because you you can anticipate a certain amount over a long period of time but you can't expect um, year after year like we've had the last um, you know four years I think so four or five years so, so it's it's you have to um, you have to keep all that all those things um, in mind when you're setting rates um, because you can't uh, depend uh, that, that you're going to have capital facility charge revenues like we have, you know, re in the recent years. Okay, thank you. Councilmember, <clears throat> excuse me, Councilmember Freed. Is it Mr. Kiriladucci? Mm -hmm. uh, can you go back to slide eight? Oh, it's not it. There's a, maybe one right before that. Yep. Um, now if you can go to slide nine. So the one thing that I take pause with is such an increase for a single family, go up by 8%. But if I hear you correctly, you're saying they have not been paying their fair share? That, yes. Shame on all of us. Well. <laughs> um, would it be unfair to go up in 2018 for 4% for single family and increase multifamily commercial and dedicated fire by 2.5%? I, I can't tell you if that would generate the full 3% needed. We'd have to run that. Mm -hmm. um, it's up to you how you, you choose to use this information as, as a council. I guess the one thing we would want to do is make sure and validate that you're going to get the full 3%. For sure. Them. What I did is I looked at slide 7 when you went back to it, just the percentage that were on there and how it was allocated, yeah. the 36% and 31% and so on. So what I did in 2018 was 4%, then 2.5 for the 3, and then in 2019, 5%, and then 1.5 forthgoing. It seemed like I reached a calculation that would get us to 3%. Um, it, it spreads the burden a little bit better. Uh, over everyone, but maybe what I'm hearing you saying to Councilmember Sandberg's answer was that would be unfair because those three classes, multifamily, commercial, and dedicated fire, are already paying their fair share. That, that's what the that's what the analysis is showing, and um, what we're trying to what we're trying to provide here is a way to get to at least close to full cost of service implementation. The council can choose not to do that or to do do it part way essentially or, or spread that out over a longer period of time. And at the same time you're not suggesting a decrease in irrigation because no. irrigation seems to be overpaying by 8% if I see. Right. It's, yeah. So what we are suggesting is rather than decrease those rates you just hold them steady and mm -hmm. in that way um, single family would require less of an increase because you're basically buying that down by okay. Great. holding irrigation steady. Thank you for your help. I appreciate it. I believe that's all the questions we had. You want to ask another round of questions? Go ahead. Can we offset the single family rate increase by increased capital facility charges? You're, you're, you're constrained from doing that because um, we, we are taking capital facilities charge revenues into account here. There are statutory requirements that tell us how we can calculate those charges and there's we can't artificially increase them beyond that cost-based amount. I'm so just the short answer is no. Well, because you mentioned earlier that the rates subsidize capital projects, but the, uh, the other way around cannot happen. Um, capital facility charges cannot subsidize operating, but the rates are subsidizing capital projects. And so why couldn't we use update uh, increased capital facility charges essentially having new growth pay for more of the uh, capital projects instead of being subsidized by rates well, subsidized part, yeah part of the answer too is that not all the capital projects are growth related they're not all growth related so it, it, i don't even that you know so we we uh, we did max out we increased the capital facility charges for water sewer last year to the full amount that we felt was reasonable, so we did the full increase on those. All right, thanks. We'll see you guys October 17th for a public hearing. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is AB 17-160, Council Direction on Maintenance and Upkeep 
of Wayne Golf Course prior to acquisition and potential approval of right of access agreement between the City of Bothell and Forterra Northwest. And I believe we have Tracy to give the staff presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Let me just bring this up. As we begin, my name is Tracy Perkowski, and it's a pleasure to stand before you this evening. Um, I'm here tonight to ask your direction on maintenance and upkeep um, for the Wayne Golf Course prior to the city's potential acquisition. So first, um, a little background, just a little bit of history to sort of help us set the stage. Um, first off, uh, uh, even before 2016, that's listed on the slide, um, several community groups, including One Bothell um, and Forterra and the city, um, charged together to figure out what we could do for Wayne Golf Course. Um, and in early 2016, Forterra purchased the land as part of a buy and hold strategy. Um, and that is to, was to allow the city to gain some time to figure out how we might be able to finance the purchase, um, as well as also to make the determine as to whether or not we actually wanted to uh, acquire the land. Um, and in December 2016, um, an initial MOU was approved by you, the City Council, which included a, a, a segment in there to create a framework. And the intent of that framework was for the various parties, specifically the City and Forterra, um, to hash out the financial and transactional responsibilities of the mutual uh, parties. Unfortunately, um, that framework was not completed either by the city or Forterra. Um, that, I'll come back to that later on. In December of last year, um, council approved a payment of almost $50,000 to Forterra to help pay for their administration costs for 2015 and part of calendar year 2016. Um, King County also contributed an equal amount. Um, as a result of that payment, um, in the staff report, it was listed that we would be using some of our grant funds. Um, so I just want you to be aware that when I come before you in November to talk about the purchase and sale agreement, um, we will need to find an additional almost $50,000 to help finance that purchase. Um, and earlier this calendar year, council directed the city manager to initiate um, a purchase and financing plan for the newly named Wayne and Sammamish Regional Park based on the staff plan that was presented that evening. Sorry, one moment. So I'm here tonight to actually specifically talk about golf course operations. As part of the land acquisition, there are essentially two pieces of the property. One is a single family home that currently has a tenant, um, and the other portion is the Wayne Golf Course having golf course operations. Um, Forterra currently holds two revenue generating leases on the property, um, and uh, they use it to help pay for some of their holding costs, property taxes, insurance, management fees, etc. Um, again, I'm going to only be talking about the golf course operations this evening. Forterra was notified that the current operator, the Richards family, um, intended to cease their operations on September 30th, um, and as a partner in the process, they notified us. And that's largely because after the acquisition is completed, um, the city would assume any lease for a new golf course operator. As such, we issued a joint request for proposal um, by Forterra and the city to secure a new operator. That joint RFP was released on July 17th. Um, our former Parks and Rec Director communicated with over 10 organizations about this opportunity, he made phone calls, sent out emails, mailed copies of the RFP. Um, our proposal was due on August 14th, um, and unfortunately we only received one incomplete response, and that was from Wayne Clark Golf. Um, as a result, we reopened the RFP for one week until August 22nd to receive a complete response. We wanted to make sure that uh, we gave Mr. Clark the opportunity to uh, add some additional information um, as we were really interested in his proposal. Um, he did submit a revised response, um, and by opening the RFP, that also enables anyone else who's interested to also submit a response. Uh, we received a letter from Premier Golf Centers, um, who sent us a letter indicating that they were potentially interested in partnering with us on a point of sale items. Those would be computers, um, mobile apps, uh, access to their um, telephone number to reserve tea times, um, uh, and helping us out with marketing. So the staff took a look at the formal proposal submitted by Wayne Clark Golf. Um, there were a number of pieces of missing information that were requested as part of the request for proposal process, such as a detailed budget, a marketing plan. Um, we were looking for, a, along with Forterra, a $25,000 performance and damage bond, um, 
uh, how he was going to pay for potential property investments, as well as a standard formatted business plan. Um, despite the fact that we were missing all of this information, we still wanted to bring in Mr. Clark, um, invite him in for some questions, try and get some clarification um, to figure out was there a way that we could make this work. As a result of a fairly long and extensive interview process, um, here's what our panel determined. And that panel was comprised of uh, city staff, city management, finance experts, and parks and recreation experts. Um, unfortunately, his budget was based on merely percentage increases or decreases from the current operator's profit, profit and loss statement. He indicated that he had no plan to fund the capital improvements which were key to the revenue increases to help pay his requested $66,000 annual management fee. Um, and this was perhaps the most alarming to all of us. Um, he requested that his expenses um, and or the management fee be prepaid to him. Um, that's actually considered a gift of public funds according to the Washington State Constitution. Um, and then as we began to talk further about some of the extensive capital improvements that were needed, um, he shared with us some additional information, actually, with, with which we were unaware. Um, he, ex he explained to us that during the summertime when it's very hot, um, the HVAC system is very poor, and when you plug a fan into the clubhouse, it actually trips the circuit breaker. And so um, even the possibility of putting in a fan um, is problematic. We also discovered as part of that discussion that he was missing some budget items, such as how to pay for computers, the point of sale, um, uh, restaurant inventory, pro shop inventory. As part of his proposal, he further indicated the deteriorated state of the course. And I know that it's much beloved um, by the community and, and we appreciate that, um, but his way of reaching a net zero proposal in order to pay his $66,000 annual management fee um, was to improve the course. And as you can see here through his own words, he writes, through the years, this golf course has suffered from neglect and will take some time to get it to a level that will change its reputation. There are many investments that could be made over time, but the following would be most immediate investments worth considering. I know that there are nine items here on this list. Drainage work, that would actually be on some of the fairways, cart paths, additional tea areas, signage, the computers, um, equipment, better golf, courts, golf carts and maintenance equipment, better golf cart storage, a wash area, and the better heating and cooling system for the golf shop building. Um, as staff followed up, um, both on the interview and as part of our due diligence for the potential acquisition of the property, um, we've been out several times to, to take a look at the facility. Um, and we too remarked on the poor HVAC system. Um, I was in there one day and it was very, very stuffy. There's damage to the exterior wood of the clubhouse. Um, there are deep holes on the gravel cart paths. Um, one day that I was out there, I saw a golf cart nearly uh, do a full rollover was taking a turn, probably a little bit too fast, but there was a deep divot. Um, and you might be able to say, you know, that that's a one-off, but you turned around and you looked at the fence and you realized that it wasn't. There were a number of holes and issues with the fence. Um, so certainly that's a serious safety issue that has to be addressed. Um, the greens were poorly maintained, as were the fairways, the tee boxes, and again, the fences as a result of some golf cart issues. There were loose bridge planks. The um, stairs to the restroom are very steep and very narrow. Um, there are dead and dying trees. Um, and for a government facility, so as we think about future acquisition of the property, um, there's a real lack of ADA access. The restrooms are a key part of it. There are only stairs down to the restroom. There are still stairs up into the clubhouse to be able to go in and pay for your rounds. Um, and then the access to the back nine, um, that pedestrian path, is a very, very steep hill. Um, and then also as part of our research, there were some inspection issues with the restaurant, um, particularly with refrigeration and uh, quality meat handling. Um, and so that led us to believe that there would be new uh, appliances needed. As a result of all of this um, and some extensive discussion, um, we rejected the RFP response from Mr. Clark. It was non-viable and not financially prudent. Um, there was no way that we could figure out how to make those financial numbers work, pay Mr. Clark his fee, and of course, avoid our gift of public funds issue. He had a lack of a formal business plan, a lack of marketing plan. There was no clear cut path as to how he was gonna increase revenues. 
Um, he even stated that his increased revenues were based on percentages versus analysis in order to um, become a net even proposal. And so what I hope you're getting here is um, you could really see this as sort of a chicken and egg scenario. We needed to do investments to be able to increase the quality of the course, to be able to increase the revenues, um, but there was no plan to actually pay for those capital improvements. So that, um, so that was concerning to us. So where does that leave us now? Um, as I began working on this project, staff was under the impression that the city was financially responsible for all of the maintenance on the Wayne Golf Course leading up to the potential acquisition. As it turns out, um, that wasn't true. If you'll recall, as I began this discussion, I talked about the MOU that was passed the end of last calendar year and the absence of that framework that was adopted. So moving forward with our original plan that the city was responsible for the financial maintenance, we approached Forterra and said, how about we provide basic maintenance on the property and we do that through a right of access agreement? They thought that that was a good idea. That's option one in front of you. Further analysis showed that there'd be a fiscal impact of $87,000, which breaks down to $37,000. So those are um, one park's lead position, one park's maintenance position for the three months um, fully benefited, and $65,000 for equipment. I'd like to stress that those are one-time costs. The two positions are included in our approved budget beginning January 1st, um, and the equipment um, would be a one-time purchase. The equipment, by the way, can also be used at our other parks facilities. For the staffing, we do see that those two individuals working exclusively at the Wayne Golf Course for the first three months um, that they would be employed with us, assuming that you approve option number one. And that is because as I went through the list of, of all the issues at the course, in order to allow the public on the property and have it be safe. Um, we, we felt like we needed two dedicated individuals. After January, when we had taken care of some of those basic safety issues, um, those staff members would be spread out not only between the Wayne Golf Course property, um, but also taking care of some of our other parks maintenance. The equipment breaks down as uh, one uh, large mower for approximately $25,000 um, and the remaining money for two uh, heavy duty utility carts. At nearly 90 acres, it's an incredibly large property and we need a way to effectively move our staff around um, as well as their equipment. We cannot use our existing mower, uh, at least long term, on the property. Um, it would take approximately 26 staff hours to mow the 90 acres. In other words, one poor staff member would be spending doing nothing um, but mowing the lawn. And the downside to that would be that we wouldn't have a mower to handle our other facilities, such as all our, ball, our ballparks. So um, that's the reason for the equipment. Option number two um, is that U.S. Council decide not to move forward with paying any of the expenses, not to move forward for the right of access agreement, um, and Forterra takes on the maintenance. We did have a conversation this morning with Forterra, um, and after I'm done, I'm gonna invite Michelle Connor, the executive vice president, to come up and, and talk about number two. Um, and then third, there has been some additional discussion about can we keep the golf course open? Um, and in order to do that, it's staff's recommendation that you approve the right of access agreement because more uh, intensive maintenance will be needed to make sure that the course would be viable to be able to be reopened in April, May, June of next calendar year. Um, the, the, the course hasn't been aerated in quite some time. It needs some fertilizer. Um, we spoke with the golf superintendent at the city of Everett. Um, they have a very... Um, high-end course, um, and he told us what kind of basic maintenance would be needed over the winter to make sure that we didn't have turf mortality. And two key components of that are a, a pesticide plan um, and a plan to prevent fungus. Um, and so for this one, I would recommend, you know, that the right of access agreement be approved. There's one thing that I would like to um, note about this third option. As we move forward thinking about potential future golf, we have two options when we think about the funding and the actual purchase of the Wayne Golf Course. One is if we keep with our current funding plan that was described to you earlier this year, golf operations would be limited to approximately two years. And that's because the money that we plan to use to purchase part of the front nine has limits on it and golf would not be permitted. However, if we want to operate golf long-term 
And what staff has heard is that there might be more vendors out there who'd be willing to take on golf course operations, be more financially beneficial for them for it to be longer than two years. Um, I would need that direction from you, and I would need to go back and do some additional research on the funding sources. I had a good conversation with King County today, um, and I need some specific legal advice from them as to how those funding sources even out and whether or not we would be able to actually use those for acquisition. If we could not use those funding sources for acquisition and we, we wanted to keep the golf option open for longer than two years, we could be looking at trying to find an additional $800,000 for the purchase of the property. Before I close, I just want to quickly address Mr. Bain's comment from earlier from public comment. I thought they were very thoughtful and I really appreciate your insights. Um, we are excited about uh, the possibility of using volunteers and stewards, um, not only at North Creek, but should we decide to acquire Wayne and also at many of our other properties. We really see that as a key to be able to handle the maintenance and move forward on these properties. So thank you so much for your generous offer. We really appreciate that. And with that, I don't want to close without bringing up Michelle to talk a little bit about option number two. And then I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Thank you for having me. This is Michelle Connor with uh, Forterra, for the record. Uh, I believe you all have received a letter, and I'll provide it to the clerk. Uh, so, as you all know, back in May of 2015, uh, we came before the council to discuss the front nine and presented sort of the way we've worked with cities across the region, the county, on a number of acquisitions, which includes the jurisdiction taking responsibility for the property if there isn't a lessor on the property. <clears throat> so with that in mind, we'd assume that it would make sense for the city to take on management for three months before taking on ownership and the assumption that we were moving forward. However, I was surprised by the cost, and if it's helpful for the city, we would be quite willing to hold it and manage it for the interim months. We wouldn't be able to do the intensive work uh, that Tracy outlined with the staff time, but we could make sure that it's you know, taken care of and do the basics. Uh, we wouldn't be able to take on any major capital work, but uh, we do our best to, you know, take good care. So I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, both of you. Uh, is there any questions? Councilmember Samberg? Well, I appreciate the generous offer from Forterra, but I wonder what it's going to cost us in the end, because we heard tonight that, um, you know, that we basically paid Forterra um, $100,000 in their services, 49 and change from us, the other half from King County. And we were using that from grant funds that we now are finding that we're gonna have to come up with that money again anyway. So I just, I appreciate the offer, I just don't feel that I guess I'm not convinced that it's going to be offered in 100% generosity and that we won't have to pay for it again at some point in the future, wrapped into final closing costs. So the, I, I just, I hate to keep accepting these offers, not knowing when the payment is really gonna come due. That was in the form of a question, I believe, or is it just a statement? Well, maybe um, Ms. Connor can come up and address that. Um, I'm sorry, could you frame the question for me? I mean, I understand will, your will concern. Forterra, will, for, will Forterra expect reimbursement for your maintenance costs at, at rolled in at closing? For the, for the three months or so, if the city decides to purchase it? Yeah. Uh, no, if there's a major cost that comes up that we can't afford, we'll come to the city and the county and discuss it at the time and give you the opportunity to make a decision about it. And what do you think your maintenance will entail? We'll just try to keep people off the property that are not doing proper things and we'll try to make it available as we can for volunteer stewardship and activities such as what David mentioned. Okay, thank you. Any other dis uh, questions? Councilmember Freed. There was a mention of loose boards on the bridges. That causes me some concern. Is there a plan for safety of those bridges? So I can speak to you after the city acquire or potentially acquires the property, mm -hmm. 
or in the three month period, I can direct those questions to Ms. Connor. Yeah, we're going to put a sign up say do not cross, or is there actually serious concern? We're not familiar with the concern with the bridges. The golfers have been using it, but we would trust the city. I think the city has offered to send an inspector out there, and I suppose if they're unsafe, we would just put up a notice and yep. fencing. That's good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. And any, if there's anything like that, we'd be happy to accommodate. So the issue with the kitchen was raised or the bathrooms, and I suppose we could just say those aren't available. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be that the golf course could actually be, would actually be closed. Nobody's, are they currently allowed to walk the property or are we putting up signs, no trespassing? I suspect that it might make more sense to say passive walking is allowed and no mm -hmm. golfing mm -hmm. because I think you'd actually have less trouble with vagrancy and illicit activities if responsible neighbors were strolling around keeping an eye on it, mm -hmm. so. Okay, thanks Michelle. Um, I am curious what it would cost actually to run a golf course. Have we done a study of what it would cost to go long term? Um, I have not yet. Um, if you would like that information, I can work on putting it together for you. Um, it is a, a fairly extensive process. My previous conversations with the city manager, um, because of workload and trying to work through the purchase and sale agreement in six weeks, oh my goodness, um, would be that I could have that information for you in the early part of calendar year 2018. Mm -hmm. um, it's an extensive process, either with determining, do we put out an RFP to try and get an you know, additional operator, particularly if we have a longer time period to think about, or is it going to be a municipally run course, in which case we'd have to create job descriptions, potentially get those through our unions, um, figure out the budget, make sure that we have the proper expertise on board, uh, go through health inspections, buy equipment. So um, it, it's not as easy as just sort of throwing together a number. So that mm -hmm. would be my timeline. Mm -hmm. um, well, we had, I think, 25 people here at the last council meeting. They stood and said that they wanted to keep a golf course. I don't know if that was the expectation of folks here on council. There's been a lot of discussion back and forth. So I would love to see it, but if you're talking about 2018, obviously I would see it as a uh, citizen and be happy to comment at that time. But it's it, it would be uh, good for me to understand. I think the community as a whole spoke very strongly last time that we were together, that that was an important use for them. Also need to understand the financing mechanisms. There's costs or talk about certain grants that allow for passive use, but not active use. Obviously you talked about the two year time frame. Mm -hmm. um, one of my concerns is we have a great need for fields as well. And there's talk about the four acres on the front, four acres on the back, the potential for active space. So I think Hopefully we'll see more of that financial model coming back to us so that we can understand it. And you'll see more of that information on the November 14th. November 14th. We will look forward to that day. Thanks. You're welcome. Oh, one last thing. Uh, you talked about the proposal that was given by Mr. Clark. Yes. I don't know if Mr. Clark is here or not, but you did make some comments about some things missing from that. I do want to say that I'm thankful for him submitting that uh, request to be involved. Being the only one, I think that was a citizen standing up uh, with the hope that a golf course could continue, so I applaud him for doing so. Thank you. I agree with you, and I'd also like to say that as part of our discussions, one of the things that we talked about was we felt as though that it would be a losing proposition for Mr. Clark, and that was not fair to his family either. And when we think about the morals and the values that the city of Bothell stands on, we certainly didn't want to see a gentleman lose his house over this. Councilman Regnum. Well, <clears throat> you know, I played Wayne Golf Course most of my life. Uh, my sons have played Wayne Golf Course. I've replaced five windows in my house because <laughs> of Wayne Golf Course. Uh, I love looking at Wayne Golf Course, but if we're going to save it, we better save it. You got to start mowing greens every day. Mm -hmm. You got to cover up the greens. For 35 years that I know of, course has not been, been maintained. Number two, in the fall and winter, it's a lake. You, you can't play it. I mean, and it's been like that forever. The clubhouse is in disrepair. When we first started this process uh, with Fertera and with One Bothell, if I'm not mistaken, the intent was to have it as a park, not a golf course, a park. And, and that's where we started going. I don't know where we're going to end up. Uh, would I like to see it as a golf course? Sure. Do I think we're going to be able to do that? Probably not. Will it be okay for our kids and our grandkids 
to have a huge park there. I think that's definitely the case. It's gonna be interesting. I look forward to getting more of your information and uh, carry on. I think you're up then. I want to use my words carefully and my time carefully up here. This project means a lot to a lot of people, not only in the city of Bothell, but across the region. And I think that all parties who are involved in the acquisition of the Wayne Golf Course are trying to come to the same conclusion, and that's to save it in perpetuity for the community and the region. Whether it's a golf course, whether it's sports fields, whether it's a restaurant with a bar that brings the Burke Gilman Trail, the Tolt Pipeline, the Sammamish River all together in one place, that's to come. But the point is we need to work together to make this happen. The key word is together. If a person comes forward to us and gives us an RFP to save the golf course, and it's not great, let's fix it. Let's find a way to fix it. If community members come out and say they want to volunteer their time to, to help maintain the, the park, the property, let's find a way to work with them. There's examples of us doing that, not just Wayne, but North Creek Forest. Other cities are doing it in their cities. Across the region, people are, I mean, with what's going on in this country right now, this is cool to have something, this much power in our community, this many people reaching out to help us to save something. I heard a lot of things said, but I, I can tell you, I learned how to golf at Wayne Golf Course, my wife learned how to golf at Wayne Golf Course, and my twin nine-year-old boys are learning how to golf at Wayne Golf Course. I can tell you that the golf course is not the greatest golf course in the world. I've played golf courses in Hawaii and all over the place. But it's a golf course you can just go out and learn to play golf on. But this entire process, I've kept my mouth shut and I have not talked about what I want. Because it's not about just me. It's about the community and the region and what they want. And we will be going through a community resource process, group meetings, all these different things about what Wayne can become. And we haven't locked on that yet. So with council member Agnew talking about he doesn't know if it'll succeed, I don't know if it'll succeed either as a golf course. But I know we have something very special. We're having conversations about something that's once in a lifetime opportunity to save 89 acres along the river. And when I started this vision, back when I started this vision, it wasn't about a golf course. It was about a conservation easement that said that the community paid $900,000 for something to save it in perpetuity, and that's why we are sitting here today, is because we're trying to save it. So I'm a little passionate about this, and this is not directed at any one specific person, but I wanna get this deal done. I wanna understand if we need to get partners in here to talk about golf courses, let's get them in here. If we need to get restaurants in, let's get them in. Things do take time, I understand, but we have been working on this a long time, if we have groups that are willing to step up and help us, how many millions of dollars have we raised already? Uh, over 10. Over $10 million. Do you know how many communities would die to try to do something like that? We have got a lot of partners here right now willing to help us. There was mention about the $800,000, um, potentially $800,000 in, in, in golf or whatever there, that we could do with the front nine. Let's work through that. Let's find solutions to work through that. I've talked to the city manager, you know how passionate I am about this. If I need to take time off my personal job to find a way to make this happen, I'm willing to do that. And many members of our community are willing to do that. But I am, right now, I am just at a loss as to why we, the things that I heard tonight, I'm at a loss of why I'm hearing them today. I want to find a solution to get us to the November 14th meeting to where this council can make a decision to move forward on something that we started 30 years ago. That's what I'm looking for. 
I don't want to continue to extend any further on this matter. I want to get this council the information that they're looking for so that we can move forward fiscally and make this happen. Thank you. So um, we need to give direction. We have three options on the table. Is there um, a motion? Deputy? Well, I make a motion to accept option two um, for Fatera to take on the maintenance for until we own the property. I'll second that motion. Do you want to speak to your motion? Um, well, I, to me, it seems the most fiscally prudent. Um, we don't own it, and when the city owns property, there are a uh, different set of expectations as far as operations and, and maintenance and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I'm not going to look that gift horse in the mouth. Thank you. I'd like to speak to the motion, too. Um, kind of a side thing I probably should have brought up earlier, but the, we do have a municipal code that dictates how we name parks, so just keep that in mind we got actually this not named yet we needed to name it in the future once the city actually owns it uh, anyway so the I really appreciate for Tara stepping up I think it's a, a and especially you know speaking publicly here too that it, this is a um, you know their their contribution as a partner in this project to maintain the property as we look for uh, look to the future to try to purchase it as a city uh, and King County is also involved too, and, and they've they've made some commitments, none you know official in writing or anything like that, about you know creating trails and, and helping with maintenance and and other and organizing uh, volunteer parties and things. So um, we're not just taking this on alone. Uh, we are trying to lead it because it's in our city, um, and I, I just really appreciate that the, that option two is a viable option. That it won't just become, you know, a, a homeless camp or a bunch of you know tall weeds or something like that in the interim. That the Forterra is taking it um, the next step and, and maintaining it until we can get our um, purchase in place. So, hopefully, that we purchase the property. So, that's what I have to say. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak to the motion? Councilmember Samberg. I'm sorry, I looked this way and said, <laughs> look me and how about Councilmember Free? I am honored to be called Councilmember Sandberg. Um, number two seems to make a lot of sense. Um, the Forterra owns the property right now, and they're going to continue to maintain it. I don't know if there's any legal reason why we would prevent them from maintaining their property. Okay, so, great. Councilmember Sandberg. I'll also be supporting the motion. I don't, um, I think it's appropriate for Forterra to maintain the property that they own. And that since they've um, expressed interest in the volunteer effort that was um, proposed tonight, I think that's great. Um, but I'm also curious, we never heard about this framework that was supposed to be completed. So I'm hoping as a part of this, we're completing a framework if needed, or if not, we're just getting to the, to the final agreement. Councilmember McNeil. Uh, I also will be supporting the motion, and I just wanted to say thank you to Fatera for stepping up and, and offering to help uh, keep it open and maintained. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank King County for their efforts in this as well. Councilman Agnew. I also will be supporting the motion, and again, I'd like to thank Fatera, uh, the city, and King County for their efforts, and I'm looking forward to moving on with this. All right, everybody's had a chance to speak. Uh, place, your uh, place your vote. And that is for option two. We do. Go ahead, place your vote again. Oh, there we go. Uh, passes unanimously with Councilmember Spivey absent and excused. Uh, we're going to go to recess and we'll reconvene at 8 p.m. <laughs>